dudes, Dude the Builder here. In this episode of Zig and Death, we're going to be talking about comp time. Um, one of the most important aspects of, of comp time that you uh, have to learn when you're learning Zig is that, uh, as the term says, comp time is like the shortening of two words, compile time. And, uh, well, basically, what it means is that anything that is marked as comp time in Zig has to be known at compile time. And uh, there can't be any type of uh, execution or side effects that can only happen at runtime. Okay, for example, uh, reading from a file uh, or printing to the screen, these are parts of a program that make use of, of system calls. And these are things that can only happen at runtime once your program has been compiled and it is running. So uh, there are lots of things that, that can't be done at compile time. But there are a lot of things that can be done at compile time. And comp time takes advantage of that uh, in, 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 in full. As we will see, one of the, one of the major uh, activities that we can do in comp time is uh, work with types just like any other values, just like if they were numbers or any other uh, data type. And uh, in this uh, first example that we're gonna see, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna uh, use comp time to implement what in other programming languages are called generics. In Zig, uh, we can implement generics without any other type of sub-language or domain-specific language like macros, or having a preprocessor, um, it's it's just pure Zig and uh, the use of uh, the comp time uh, functionality. So let's take a look at that. We have here a minimal uh, main dot Zig that still makes use of that point uh, uh, struct that we saw in the other uh, previous video on structs. Uh, we are ha we are making use of the version that we put aside in another file called point.zig, okay? And we're going to see how uh, we can turn this uh, point.zig uh, data structure into a generic data structure. Right now, uh, this point will only work with F32s, okay? Um, which is a little limiting because uh, we could uh, have situations where we want to use an F64, an F16, it all depends, or even maybe integers, okay, signed integers, uh, unsigned integers. And right now, we don't have that uh, flexibility with this type, okay, with this struct. So um, we're going to see how Zig allows us to turn this into a generic struct by using uh, the comp time features. Now what we're going to do here is we are going to create as as um, as we saw in the other video. Let me do an ls here of src. You're going to see that uh, we named this file point.zig and it has a capital P. This is the convention in Zig because uh, this file is defining a struct, okay, and uh, it has fields. So, uh, as in the case of defining uh, the struct directly in the source code, uh, where you assign it to a constant, and we name that constant point with a capital P, well, if you're putting it in a file, then you do the same. You, you put it in a file, and, you, and that file will have the, the capital letter, because the definition of the file is the definition of a struct with fields, okay? But in this case, we are going to be working uh, with the generic version of this uh, struct. And in that case, uh, that file will not be directly the definition of the struct. It's going to be the definition of a function, okay? And we're going to see that in a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to close out uh, close out this uh, buffer here. And we're going to move. We're going to do a move src point.zig to src point.zig, okay, which is with lowercase p now, okay, and here inside uh, the editor, now we can edit point.zig, 
And uh, what we're going to do here is start uh, converting this to a generic um, uh, data structure. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to change this from being just a direct uh, struct definition to a definition of a function. Okay, so let's do pub fn point, and uh, this uh, function is going to receive as a parameter the type that we want to use uh, for our fields. So um, it's in, in, in Zig, normally, as in other languages, when we're defining a variable for that represents the type in generics, we use the capital T. Um, and the type of this will be indeed type, which we can use. It's a keyword in Zig. And this function returns a type. Okay. And now, what we're going to do, we're going to return here struct open curly. Let's go down to the end. And there we go. So, what have we done here? Now, instead of just having uh, the definition of the struct directly in the root of the file, we have here a public function point, which is going to be basically the name of the type in combination with this parameter that we're passing in. But uh, here we have a little problem in that um, since the parameter is of type type, this parameter has to be comp time known. So um, in order to ensure that and to make it mandatory, we put here the comp time keyword. Okay. So now this is what's known as a comp time function parameter uh, named T, capital T, and uh, it's of type type. Okay, so we're going to pass a type to this function, and the function returns a type, which in this case is a struct. Okay, now um, here we can use that uh, variable t, okay, instead of directly uh, specifying f32, like here also, and um, we are going to have to change this definition here of this constant because um, now point is a function, okay? It's not the struct type. So uh, what we can do here to avoid a name conflict and what's normally the convention is to use self with a capital S, okay? It doesn't have to be self, but this is basically the convention. and wherever we had here point we can change it to self okay and down here same thing let's change this to self um, here we have the f32 let's change this to t okay and basically that's it uh, now we have a generic version of this uh, struct which is returned from this function okay uh, which uh, receives a type. So let's save this. Now, if we go to main.zig, here instead of um, importing just the, the file, let's turn this into the lowercase p. And now we have to indeed import that point function, which is it's now a function, okay? And here, instead of just using the type point, we have to instantiate. Let's call the function and let's pass it the type F32. Okay. And if we save the changes and let's try to run it. And there we go. We have basically uh, the same uh, result, but this time uh, the type that we're printing out here it says point dot point with the capital and the function call syntax with the parentheses and the, the type that we passed in so what zig does is that uh, it will assign the name of this type constructing it from the name of the function that returns the type with the parameter or parameters that we pass into that function, okay? And that's how we can distinguish that type from other types, okay? Um, 
another thing that we can do here uh, instead of calling this twice we could define a constant let's say uh, p and then define it as indeed point f32 okay and then here we can remove all this and just use p.new let's try that out and there you go it still works so uh, being uh, first class citizens in zig uh, the result of calling this uh, generic function here that, that that returns a type we can assign that type to the constant p and then we can use that p as a type we could even uh, specify it here as the type of these uh, constants okay save that run it and it still works okay so in zig given that uh, the comp time uh, context uh, allows us to deal with types just like any other value they are first class citizens we can do these types of operations assigning a type to a constant and then using it like this okay um, now this means this is a, a generic type so we can use here let's say an f16 let's run this there you go or uh, an f64 let's run it and there you go let's try a u64 okay and now we see that we have a little problem here and it's telling us that expected vector of floats or a float type okay found u64 why because uh, this uh, square root built-in uh, from from uh, the, the language itself it uh, works only on floating point types okay so we have a generic uh, struct type defined in this file but we can't make full use of that generic nature because right now uh, we have uh, a part of our logic that requires uh, specifically a float so let's see what we can do uh, we can change let's change this to f64 because we're going to be converting to f64 and um, what we can do here is make use of another comp time feature is uh, there are several built-ins that let us uh, grab some information about types in zig and um, uh, control the flow of execution based on that at comp time so let's say here for example instead of these let's comment these out we're going to do the following const if x equals and what we're going to do here is uh, we are going to use uh, a couple of those built-ins and we're going to switch on the result of them because uh, we're going to be receiving uh, tag union okay which is very handy so let's do a switch here and the switch is going to be on the type info of the type I was going to do type of T but actually I don't have to do that because T is already a type okay so we can just do type info of T and now uh, let me put the semicolon here to eliminate that error uh, this uh, tag union uh, that type info returns is really handy because it has uh, fields like float int array uh, struct and in this case what we want to do is pretty much uh, test that uh, what the type that we were receiving here is either a float or an int because that's basically the only two types that, that we can uh, work with in a point okay so let's say that if this is an int and these fields have a capital letter okay well what we're gonna do and let's I have to specify here f64 because we're going to do a cast here let's do a float from int okay 
And here, what we're going to do is the other dot x minus the other, whoops, minus self dot x. Okay, we're going to be turning that into a, uh, a float. And I specified here the type explicitly f64 because float from it will need to know uh, to what type of float it's going to be converting this. Okay, and in the case of float. If, if the type of t is a float, then we don't have to do any conversion. We just do the subtraction. So it would be other dot x minus other dot y. Okay. And if it's any other type, we can make use of another built-in, which is compile error. Okay, like here. And uh, let's uh, give this compiler a little helpful message that says only floats or hints allowed okay there we go so what are we basically doing here to recap we are uh, defining diff x and we want to at compile time because we're dealing here with types determine the, based on the info from this type that we're receiving t type info built-in will give us a tag union and we're going to switch on that and if it's a, a, an int which means that it's any of the integers in Z it could be signed or unsigned we will be doing this operation but casting it to a float okay if it's a float we don't have to cast we just do the subtraction and otherwise it's a compile error so we're going to be doing the same thing let's do let's copy this and let's uh, rename here the x's to y's. Whoops, means I had a y here and it's uh, supposed to be an x. Okay, let's try to execute it. And there you go, it works. And we obtain the same result, 1.4. And now it is indeed telling us that we're using a u64. Okay, so let's go back here. Now we want to use an i, an i8, let's say. Go run. It works. Okay. And let's go back to F32. Just to make sure that works. And that works. Okay. Um, I believe that if I try to do this, let's eliminate that here. So let's use some bulls here. False here true false clear the screen okay and here we go we finally reached our compile error it says only floater ints allowed okay so we are indeed getting uh, the expected error at compile time okay so uh, let's set this back. how it was see that it works there you go let's clear the screen and run it yeah so with that uh, that's basically what I wanted to demonstrate in this uh, first uh, video uh, talking about comp time we can see that uh, right off the bat uh, zig provides uh, a lot of power uh, for executing and evaluating uh, at compile time uh, so much that we can define generic data structures uh, by defining functions like this that receive types and return types as uh, their parameters and return types and then we can make use of types like any other value uh, in our programs okay and that's what we're doing here and we also saw how we can uh, make use of uh, the information uh, this is basically uh, comp time type reflection uh, we're uh, obtaining information about a type and, and, and making decisions based on that um, at compile time. All of this happens at compile time, okay? That's why we are able to uh, produce these compile errors, okay? We don't have to wait till runtime to, to analyze this and, and generate an error. 
So with that, I hope uh, that you find this uh, useful and, and, and amazing, this <laughs> comp time feature and functionality of Zig. We'll be talking more about other uh, aspects of comp time in, in future videos. But uh, for now, uh, do the builder here. I'll see you in the next one.